Hello everyone. Welcome to today's session. My name is Kalyani and I am your moderator for today's session. I am the Global Marketing Manager for Infrastructure Management and Cybersecurity Services at Happiness Minds Technologies. I have 10 years of industry experience in creating digital content and brand marketing. I'll quickly run you through the agenda for today. After we are introduced to the panelists, Vijay will walk us through this current cybersecurity trends. David will showcase Microsoft security offerings and provide an overview to the Microsoft Sentinel. Anand will throw some light on how can you build the next gen SOC in Azure Sentinel. And before we end the session, Vinayak will, give, will provide us the demo on Microsoft Sentinel use cases. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to the panel. David Brasbaum, Cloud Security Architect from Microsoft, who has helped Microsoft partners learn and deploy the latest Microsoft security technologies in Microsoft 365 and Azure. He has been with Microsoft for past 13 years, working in the MCS Premier and Partner Organization during this time. And from the Happiest Minds team today, we have Mr. Vijay Bharti. CISO, Happiest Minds Technologies. He brings more than 20 years of experience in IT security industry, multi, uh, spread across multiple domains like identity and access management, data security, cloud security, infrastructure security. His recent work includes building security operations center framework, including people, process, various SIEM technologies, where he's working on building an integrated view of security and ways to leverage an that leverage advanced analytics and big data innovations for cybersecurity. Mr. Anand Kumar, Practice Director of Cybersecurity Services, brings in more than 15 plus years of experience in the IT security industry. His, his uh, experience spreads across domains like advanced security monitoring services, IoT, OT security, data security, cloud security, and infrastructure security. His recent work includes establishing SOC 2.0 services, retail specific security services, building security automation and collaborative threat intelligence as service for seamless consumption by customers. He is currently focusing on developing the cloud security framework and OT security and its integration with IP. Mr. Vinayak S. Senior Practice Manager Cybersecurity Services has over 12 plus years of experience in IT security space. His expertise lies in cloud security and infrastructure security. Currently, he's responsible for designing and implementing security technologies spanning cloud and on-prem. Moving on, I'll quickly walk you through Happy, the portfolio of Happiest Minds Technologies. Happiest Minds Technologies was launched in the year 2011 by Mr. Ashok Suta, a serial entrepreneur over 30 years of experience in the global IT industry. Positioned as a mi mi mindful IT company, we enable digital transformation for enterprises and technology providers. We do this by leveraging a spectrum of disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, cloud, digital process automation, IoT, robotics, drone security, virtual and augmented reality, and more. Uniquely positioned as born digital, born agile, our capabilities span digital solutions, infrastructure, product engineering, and security services across industries. Happiest Minds Technologies it has, is headquartered in Bangalore, India, and spread across 16 cities, eight countries, and work with more than 170 plus customers. We, we had a super hit IPO last year, which was 100% digitally executed and heavily oversubscribed. And on the screen, you see some of the acquisitions we have bagged in the past few years. With that, I would like to invite Mr. Vijay for his talk. Hello, Vijay. Uh, World Economic Forum uh, conducts uh, annual uh, global risk report. Uh, this year's report for again, and and, and that report covers a, a host of various risks, right, including economical, social, uh, technology risk. Uh, 
this year of course from uh, from obvious reasons uh, some of the social and economical risks are, are are at the top but if we look at the technology risk uh, cyber security failure is still considered uh, to be one of the short term risk uh, which which can impact uh, organization in next 0 to 2 years uh, similarly, there's another uh, study done by NECD, which is National Association of uh, Corporate Directors uh, of in, in US, uh, where they try to understand what are the, the top trends, right, which are impacting the organizations in incoming years. So some of those listed there, uh, of course, digital transformation, we all know. Uh, the journey started a few years back, uh, but again, the pandemic has kind of fast-tracked it. Uh, but changing cyber security threats again appears as, as as one of the greatest impact for companies right given given a lot of disruption which is happening in the market a lot of technology trends which are evolving right uh, so again as we see cyber security uh, remains a key risk uh, all of us in the industry uh, have been trying to do cyber security from decades right uh, but still i think we, we we are still at a stage where the where the risks are pretty high uh, to understand the reason behind these ongoing cyber security challenges, probably we have to have a, a little closer view on, on what's the reason behind that and what are some of those industry uh, shifts which is which are impacting cyber security. Uh, Kalyani, can you please move to the next slide? Uh, so I have tried to capture some of those uh, shifts which we are seeing uh, in the overall industry, right, which, which are impacting cybersecurity. Uh, we talked about digitization uh, again, uh, and, and again, many businesses which, which started their digital journey uh, before pandemic, kind of able to manage it, it, it a little more effectively than, than uh, some of the other businesses. Uh, but again, pandemic has, has created a whole lot push uh, for, for businesses to go digital. Uh, one of the greatest uh, movement which is happening is towards cloud adoption, and we are seeing cloud adoption increasing across the board in the last couple of years. Uh, earlier, companies were trying to use it more for my infrastructure as a, as, a, as a service, right? But again, more adoption of PaaS, SaaS, and, and the whole uh, architecture in terms of how companies are leveraging cloud uh, has been changing. Uh, remote working. Uh, Yes, uh, again, this started, I mean, to some extent, it was it was present uh, at, at various levels. Uh, again, COVID uh, kind of really expand the scale of, of remote working. And we believe that this this the, this trend is going to continue, right? Uh, uh, and it's, it is the requirement of all the organizations to really be able to secure uh, all the remote users, all the remote working environments. Uh, supply chains, as businesses goes more digital, uh, the business processes are expanding across multiple vendors, multiple partners. Uh, data is getting spread across this entire supply chain, uh, exposing us to, to further risk. Uh, that's some, something which, which needs to be really addressed. Uh, IoT, uh, specifically connected world, right? Again, uh, this is something which, which is on the fast track, which is evolving uh with the adoption of 5g which will which will give you tremendous capabilities from a bandwidth perspective we will see uh, much more integrated and connected devices uh, which again will of course result in right in terms of uh, some of these risks expanding across coming coming to your home right along with, along with those iot devices uh devops uh, a lot of architecture right i mean some of the traditional architectures which we used to do a few years back are standard Three tire web architecture. A lot of that has is, is being changing. Uh, a lot of people are adopting uh, serverless computing, microservices, containerization. Uh, so some of the traditional ways of deploying security, uh, creating those parameters and boundaries across certain workloads, is, is kind of diminishing fast. Uh, all this is resulting in uh, a, a tremendous skill shortage, right? I mean, cybersecurity skills uh, were anyway. Uh, there was a shortage in the market, uh, but now you you need people who who understand cyber security with cloud, with with microservices, with containers, right? Uh, so it will so so things have its own learning curve. So it will still take a little bit time to for us to, to really 
uh, start seeing more more profiles in the market, more more capabilities in the market. Uh, and of, of course, uh, data privacy as as uh, we have seen the journey started. Right, I mean, it has been an area of concern for quite a, quite a long. Uh, and given the number of data breaches and and different attacks which have been happening. Uh, there are a lot of new regulations which started coming out with GDPR, California Privacy Act. Uh, and similarly, user awareness uh, is, 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 again, uh, is, is very important, right? I mean, businesses which will be able to uh, provide assurance of security and privacy to, to, the, to the users will, will definitely try. But that's, that's like, again, a key aspect, right, which, which needs to be looked into. So these are some of the industry shifts uh, which are which are keeping cybersecurity at its toes. And cybersecurity technology vendors are, are responding to these, right? And, and uh, as a result of some of these, uh, these shifts, we are always also seeing uh, uh, new methods, uh, new evolution and innovations in the overall cybersecurity. Uh, some of the areas I've tried to capture here, uh, of course, AI, ML, as, as the data sets becomes huge, as uh, the, the talent becomes a challenge, uh, it is expected uh, to do a lot more with AI, ML, uh, which is now being adopted at, at across all layers, including at your endpoints with EDR, with your, on your network with NDR, uh, similarly in, in your security operations at, at your sim layers to be able to collect those data and uh, be able to run AI ML based queries and threat hunting capabilities around that. Uh, MDR, XDR, and, and uh, one of the area, right, is in, uh, because of digitization, because of uh, expanding footprints of, of these processes, right, a, a lot of data at different endpoints getting generated. Uh, some of the traditional SIEM solutions which we which we used to have uh, on prem may, may, may are getting challenged from a scalability perspective. So we are seeing adoption of, of more cloud-based uh, uh, technologies, right? Cloud native sims or more focused towards XDR, NDR, which which, uh, which kind of bring in a lot of automation, a lot of self-learning and, and faster response capabilities. A zero trust architecture, uh, uh, the concept has been around for quite a while, but again, uh, COVID and remote working is, is really pushed it. Uh, the idea is in terms of how do you, do you uh, create more, uh, more, more visibility and verification at each layer, right? So based on the user uh, leveraging multi-factor authentication, for example, uh, to to enhance the authentication capabilities, uh, also be able to identify the device, the posture of the device from which the user is logging in, uh, and also uh, not trusting the network and and the boundaries, right? And and verifying. Again, at each level, at when when the user is trying to access those applications, uh, secure access service edge uh, again considered as the next uh, generation of network security. Uh, in today's time, most of the email security proxy has already moved to the cloud, uh, but again, SASE will drive uh, the complete network security, including your firewalls, including let's say zero trust architectures. Uh, where some of these security policies can be applied based on user identity, user context, and the organization security policies, right? To be able to give a seamless access for users working from, from anywhere across the world. Uh, privacy by design. Uh, uh, I think after uh, many years, uh, industry was uh, learning to, to make in security uh, by design. Uh, now, now we have also started seeing uh, privacy to be addressed uh, right at the design stage. Uh, again, a lot of evolution in tools and technologies in terms of automated data classification, uh, data protection based on different level of classifications, uh, which is helping organizations to really uh, adopt and bake in privacy in, in their systems, applications, and processes. Uh, DevSecOps, uh, uh, one of the promise of DevOps, uh, a faster CI, CD, uh, slowly uh, security was introduced, but somewhere uh, organizations are realizing that security sometimes slows the overall pipeline down. Right? Uh, and one of the reasons for that was uh, some of the security was not, not contextualized uh, as, as part of that CICD pipeline. So today we are seeing emergence of a lot more automation, a lot of context, uh, sensitive security as part of 
whether it is your your dynamic security code analysis, whether your, your penetration testing, or deploying security policies uh, along with your infrastructure as code when when you are provisioning uh, some of some of these uh, workloads on onto your cloud environments. Uh, IT OT convergence, uh, the whole shift uh, to industry 4.0. Uh, organizations wants to leverage the capability scalability of cloud analytics uh, and which is resulting in exposure or opening up of those boundaries which were traditionally built around your OT, OT networks. Uh, so we, we, have, we have started seeing a lot of uh, convergence happening at IT and OT layers and, and a lot more tools, technologies and solution providers coming up to address those challenges. Uh, cloud native security as uh, cloud adoption increase. Uh, because uh, organizations were sometimes getting challenged in terms of trying to extend some of their uh, traditional tool sets on cloud. Uh, fortunately, cloud providers realize that, and then we are seeing a lot of uh, focus and development of cloud security capabilities, uh, native capabilities for many of these cloud providers. So these are some of the technology challenges, and uh, uh, one of the leading technology provider that's Microsoft. Uh, is really helping us right in terms of uh, bringing that focus on multiple tools technologies uh, to help us address some of these challenges uh, we today have uh, david uh, who is a cloud security architect from microsoft and he will help us to uh, go through understand uh, the overall uh, security offering from microsoft and then we will get a little deeper into how microsoft sentinel can really help us uh, to build a strong foundation for our next-gen software, which can help us to, to cover the complete detection and response capability uh, as we explore from our next generation software perspective. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'll now hand it over to David uh, for his session. Thank you, BJ. Um, very nice introduction. And, and, and we'll kind of dig a little bit into a couple of the topics that, that you um, highlighted there. So if we go to the next slide and uh, we can start talking a little bit um more about uh the you know what what the last year has done and if you want to build out the slide that's fine with all the, the individual points um really what we've seen over the last year has has been dramatic and and, and bj brought that out uh, very clearly in his discussion um what that's resulted in <clears throat> for most of us is uh first of all we we saw this shift to um a a at, at least a hybrid type of work. And in most cases, it was a, um, uh, a fully remote type of work initially. And then as, as things have sort of loosened up in different parts of the world, uh, we've seen some businesses opening up a little bit and, and uh, inviting people back into the offices. Um, and, and what this means is that uh, being able to access data from outside of the corporate network has become more and more critical. Add to that the fact that initially, when when all this happened, there was a challenge for many organizations around getting devices to their people. So, um, for the first uh, several months, um, you know your major computer vendors, uh, HP and Lenovo and Dell and you know all these other vendors, uh, simply ran out of devices. Right? They they, they didn't have. Uh, they weren't planning on shipping thousands of devices. Um, so quickly to to customers who immediately had this need to support uh, remote workers, and so what we ended up with was a BYOD situation and organizations trying to get their heads around how do we secure these devices that we don't own, that we don't manage, that that we have limited visibility into. <clears throat> then. Um, once we had that uh, kind of settled a little bit, um, we had to figure out how do we start detecting issues in these networks? So um, people that are connecting with maybe their personal laptop into the corporate network, um, how do we understand, uh, how do we get visibility into what's going on on that device? What kind of data they're storing on that device? what uh, third-party cloud applications they're connecting to from that device that might uh, represent a, a DLP risk. Um, and, and part of the challenge that came along with that, that issue was 
that some organizations had solutions, but they were in silos, right? Um, they, they, they were able to get visibility into one piece of the problem, and then another silo had visibility into a different piece. Um, but there wasn't a uniform sort of visibility that they had uh, that allowed them to see the entire landscape and to see what their end users were doing, what the device's uh, health and, and compliance status was, what applications they were connected to, and so on. Because there was this uh, 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 kind of flurry of activity that was taking place in the first probably six months of of the uh, the lockdown, the bad actors, the threat actors understood that there was a period of vulnerability that they could act in. And they did. Uh, they began exploiting these vulnerabilities. And this was uh, worsened or, or, or was that some organizations were made more vulnerable by the fact that they had not fully optimized their networks to prevent things like lateral movement. So what all this this uh, brings us to is the fact that our existing networks are not uh, built to accommodate uh, a situation like what, what we saw last year. Um, if we could go to the next slide. And so uh, what we did see last year was a dramatic uptick in, in uh, threat activity. So there's a, a, a saying that the um, that the uh, uh, the bad actors will follow a crisis. In other words, if there's a hurricane, a tornado, uh, um, a terrorist act, uh, some, so something bad happens, a global pandemic, you're going to find bad actors swooping in and trying to take advantage of that for their own benefit. And that's exactly what we saw last year. We saw this massive uptick in password spray attacks. We saw uh, huge amounts of uh, data being uploaded to risky applications uh, from inside corporate networks. Um, just in the month of August, we saw 5 billion um, attacker-driven sign-in attempts. And uh, about a third of all the attacks on enterprise accounts involved phishing to one degree or another. So the attackers were busy and, and, and uh, that presented a problem um, as Vijay brought out. Uh, next slide, please. Now, because we have this new reality that we have to deal with, uh, this remote work, hybrid work, whatever you want to refer to it as, um, bring your own device is, a, is, is very much a um, uh, kind of a baked in situation for many organizations. What this means is that the old assumptions about network security, device security, identity security, those are no longer enough to keep us secure. We can't believe that everything behind the corporate firewall is considered safe. Um, we can't keep operating under those same old principles. And so we have these three principles that underpin uh, the zero trust methodology that BJ uh, referred to. The first one is explicit verification. So no longer trusting a, um, a user authentication attempt simply because they have a password, but going in and looking at the different available data points around that authentication attempt, including the user's identity, their location, the health of their device, the workload that they're trying to connect to, the data, the, the specific data types that they're trying to connect to, and so on. And any, and any anomalies that go along with that, uh, we're taking note of that. Using least privilege access. So once we've decided, yes, you, you can have access to these things, grant the least level of access to that data or to the service that you're trying to connect to, if it's an administrative task that you're trying to perform, how do we uh, limit the uh, potential administrative vulnerability that comes along with uh, very highly privileged accounts, giving just-in-time access, just enough access. And then finally, the assumed breach mentality. What this is talking about is minimizing what we call the blast radius. So if a machine gets compromised 
okay, that's 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 uh, that's not good. But how do we limit um, where the attackers can go from there? How do we limit their lateral movement, their escalation of privileges, um, and just keep that blast radius to uh, the machine that was initially compromised? Next slide, please. And so, as I said, this this is where zero trust comes in. The idea that every authentication is going to be strongly um, validated using perhaps multi-factor authentication with um, uh, maybe Windows Hello, multi-factor, uh, uh, some, some other uh, Microsoft Authenticator, for example, and, and looking at the applications that the user is connecting to, the device that they're coming from, and what they're trying to get to, and putting that all through a policy engine that says, if this is the case, then I want to uh, grant access according to this set of criteria. And in addition to being able to gate that authentication and gate that access, we want to be able to have analytics around that. Uh, that's fine. You, you can go ahead and go forward to the next slide that, that, that uh, dovetails nicely with what I was talking about. And so the, um, the pillars that make up zero trust are the six things that we see here. So identity, verifying the user with strong authentication, make sure that their access is compliant and that it's typical for that identity and it follows the least privilege access principle. With the endpoints, how do we monitor and enforce device health and compliance to make sure that uh, the access is secure? Applications, are the applications uh, being monitored in real time? Are the methods that, that you use to access the applications, the APIs or uh, the, the authentication methods, are those secure? Is the data being accessed? Is it classified? Is it labeled? Is it encrypted? Do we know where that data lives? And can we track where it goes if it leaves our network? And the infrastructure, are we able to make sure that if a, if a user is trying to access a piece of the infrastructure, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, that that piece of infrastructure is secure? The networking, uh, do we know uh, what networks are considered safe um, and, and uh, trusted within our organization? And do we have visibility into the pipe? And, and can, can we see the data that's flowing across that network? So if we go to the next slide and uh, talk about where uh, zero trust actually comes in here, this is really the model, right? We, we've got the identities and the uh, devices on the left-hand side. And we've got the resources that those are trying to access on the right-hand side. And so in order to bring those two together, in order to grant an identity access to some data, it goes through the policy engine there in the middle. And that policy engine makes a decision that says, if you're coming from this network and you're connecting on this device and you are... Um, uh, you've, pro you've provided multi-factor authentication, then I will grant you access to this set of applications. That's the, uh, the, 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 the basic um, model for Microsoft Zero Trust architecture. And so to accomplish that, if we go to the next slide, we see that there are a variety of technologies that allow this to take place. You may have to click to, to build out some of the uh, the, the technologies there. Um, so if we look at, for example, identities, we see that Microsoft Azure AD is part of that. If we look at uh, the devices, Microsoft Endpoint Manager is what's used to um, ensure the compliance and the, and the security of the device. When we go over to the right-hand side, Microsoft Information Protection allows you to classify uh, and, and label your data and ensure that uh, maybe it's encrypted if it's confidential data. Going to the apps, Microsoft Cloud App Security will allow you to uh, verify the, the security of applications, third-party applications that your users may be connecting to. 
Azure Security Center helps with your Azure infrastructure, your AWS, uh, Google, and on-prem infrastructure as well. And then Azure networking components can help secure your, uh, your network. And then the, the, the blue circle there in the middle is what really uh, the, the, this whole discussion is about. Azure Sentinel and Microsoft Defender XDR, um, helping us to understand and, and get visibility into all these components and alert us on any issues that uh, may be arising in the network. So let's go ahead and go to the next section or the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about um, Azure Sentinel. Next slide, please. So as, as we've really been talking and, and, and highlighting, uh, uh, security organizations uh, within or, or security teams within an organization have a real challenge, right? The, the, the digital estate is, is expanding. It's covering uh, numerous types of devices. It's not just servers, laptops, and desktops anymore. There's tablets, there's phones, there's IoT sensors, there's all these types of devices that are internet connected and are sending uh, critical information back to the organization. And somehow they have to get their, 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 their arms around how to secure all this and, and bring it into compliance. Next slide, please. And so as we've been talking about, there are challenges. So the threats are growing in volume and complexity. There are so many signals that it's very difficult for teams to, to make sense of them and act on all of them because there's thousands of potential feeds of, of data that they have to sift through. Um, as Vijay brought out, there's a, a global shortage of uh, good security talent and people that, that can uh, read, uh, you know, a, 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 a uh, a, a network monitor trace and, and understand what's going on. Um, and, it, and it takes time to do these things. It takes time to investigate a uh, potential incident or, or an alert and, and make some good decisions about it. So if we go to the next slide, that's really where this, uh, this idea of using Microsoft Azure Sentinel comes into play. Now, why is Azure Sentinel such a... Um, uh, a step forward for many security organizations. Number one, it is cloud native. It is not simply a bunch of VMs that have been moved from an on-premise infrastructure into the cloud. And if you need more capacity, you build more VMs. It is Azure services. So you have Azure scale and it is built purely in the cloud. So you have limitless cloud speed, limitless cloud scale. Right now we have the, the option, um, which you know, for, for, for how long it'll last, I'm not sure, but um, we have the option for customers to bring in, not just their Office 365 data, as it says here on the slide, but your Azure activity logs, your Defender logs, uh, your Cloud App security logs, all those can be brought into Azure Sentinel for free. So you can start getting visibility into what's happening in your environment. It does integrate with your existing tools. So if you have Splunk or QRadar, Logarithm or something like that, you can start integrating slowly uh, with Azure Sentinel and, and still keep those, um, those on-prem solutions maybe in place until you've got all your correlation rules and, and uh, playbooks and things like that can uh, convert it over to Sentinel. And it does use Microsoft's uh, quite uh, effective artificial intelligence and machine learning tool sets so that um, you can get better understanding of the data and um, can make better decisions about alerts that you see. Next slide, please. What this means, because it's, it's built in the cloud, is that um, it takes much of the burden off of your SecOps team because they don't have to worry about building infrastructure. They don't have to worry, is the storage uh, going to run out? Do I need to buy more storage for my SAN? Um, the service is available right in the Azure portal. It scales automatically. There's no built-in limits. You can put in limits if, if that's what your um, uh, you know, budget requires, and that's fine. 
Um, but there's no built-in limits automatically uh, applied to uh, the Sentinel uh, service. And so what that means is you can get running very quickly with Azure Sentinel. Next slide, please. Because of uh, the, the, the way that uh, Sentinel is architected, this means you only pay for what you use. In other words, you're not overbuying, uh, you're not provisioning infrastructure, anticipating how much usage uh, you're going to require. Um, essentially, what you're doing with Sentinel is you're buying the storage that you're using. So as logs are ingested into Sentinel, that storage is what you're paying for. You're not paying for um, additional storage on top of that. Um, this gives you the ability also to set up uh, things like a uh, capacity reservation, uh, which allows you to be um, uh, to to be more predictable in in your billing. So if you know that on average you're ingesting 10 gig a day, you can set up capacity reservations, which allow you to get a discounted rate on a certain amount of storage. So you can just ingest data and, and, and pay for what you're using, or you can get a little bit lower rate by saying, we anticipate that we're going to use this much, so please set aside this much data or, or the, this much storage for us. So that model can be uh, transitioned from month to month. So you can either do a pay as you go or a capacity reservation, and you can uh, essentially switch back and forth depending on what's most effective for your uh, payment uh, methodology. Next slide. Now, as I mentioned, we do have integration, obviously, with Microsoft solutions and, and uh, the, the native cloud solutions are the ones that, that work uh, you know, right out of the box very easily. You set up uh, just with a few clicks and, and you have Microsoft 365 data being ingested for Defender and Office 365 and so on. But there are also connectors that you can use to ingest data from other partner solutions. So Barracuda and um, uh, Zimperium and, and, and other vendor. vendors um, have connectors that you can use to pull data from their solutions into Sentinel and get visibility into these other third-party products. We also have the ability to bring in data from um, Syslog and Ceph. So if you have a number of Linux devices or uh, your standard networking devices that are using syslog, we can ingest uh, those syslog sources into Sentinel. And then you have uh, visibility across uh, all the different platforms and even uh, from, from other cloud providers. So we can ingest data from AWS, GCP, Salesforce, uh, Zoom, Slack. Uh, so, so your data from all those places can be brought into Sentinel. Next slide. If you have the ability to, and, and, and uh, perhaps data scientists on staff that are building machine learning models around security of your unique environment, um, those models can be brought into Azure Sentinel and used as a way of detecting anomalies or threats in your environment. So there's a lot of um, alerts and, and um, uh, types of, of detections that are built into Sentinel, and that's great. But uh, Microsoft, for example, doesn't necessarily know how to detect a threat against an oil pipeline or uh, some you know, manufacturing line for a, a car manufacturer, right? We, that, that, that's not uh, a standard part of our business. So if you have that type of machine learning model to understand what those threats look like, then you can ingest those into Sentinel and, and use those with your unique uh, industry knowledge um, as a way of detecting threats. And, and the GitHub community is very um, healthy. So there's lots of alerts and, and tools that you can use there. Next slide, please. So uh, building on this idea of the AI, there are uh, a number of different detections, um, depending on, on the, the number of data sources that you're getting, right? You could have hundreds of detection rules, 
uh, that are based on Microsoft's understanding of how attacks take place against Microsoft products, right? We, we see this all the time. And so we build rules. Our own um, uh, security teams have worked very closely with the Sentinel team and said, these are the things that we need to look for in our own environment. So these are probably things that customers should be looking for in their environment. You can also bring in threat intelligence feeds. So if you're using something like Anomaly or MISP or whatever it might be, taxi uh, feeds, you can bring those into um, Azure Sentinel as well uh, to enhance your uh, detections. And then the next slide, please. So as you begin to investigate threats in your Azure Sentinel environment, you can get visualizations like, uh, like you see here on the slide. You can see um, the entire attack in its, in its uh, scope. Um, and then what was impacted? Was it an end user? Was it a device? Was it a service? What IP address did they come from? What artifacts did they leave behind on the machine? Was there a process? Was there an executable? Was there uh, a scheduled task that was left behind on the machine? These, the, these artifacts that help you to investigate and create rules around um, how to respond to these types of things in the future. And you can build those into uh, notebooks, um, for example, that can allow you to repeat that process over and over and over again uh, so that your uh, your, your security team knows how to hunt for the same type of thing in the future. Let's go to our next slide. And so as, uh, as we've been talking about, there are different ways to um, automate your response. So one of the things that, that, that we've talked about is, is how Azure Sentinel is a SIM, but it is also a SOAR platform. It provides the ability to orchestration and automation and remediation. So you can create automated responses to certain um, uh, types of alerts or incidents. So you can use Azure Logic Apps, you can use um, PowerShell scripts. So, I mean, there's a variety of different ways that you can respond to a, a noted alert or a, an, an incident um, using uh, automated tools. <clears throat> and that can help alleviate some of the burden that exists on your security team. So that brings me to my to, to the end of my discussion. Um, I'll hand things over now to, I believe it's um, uh, uh, Anand. Is Anand that's uh, next? And, yes, and um, he'll talk a little bit about more uh, the, uh, uh, the Happiest Minds solution. So thanks for your attention. Thanks, David. Yeah, can we go to the next one, Glenn? Right. Thanks, David. Thanks for that uh, wonderful session. Uh, so we now heard what all can we do with uh, Azure Security and uh, Azure Sentinel as, uh, specifically. Uh, we now focus a little more on um, how uh, we can you know, use Sentinel, how exactly could we leverage all the capabilities, security capabilities uh, built in Azure into powering a next-gen SOC. Right? So that's what uh, we will talk about in this session. Uh, as such, as part of our services that we extend, uh, we engage with our customers in almost all phases, uh, starting with consulting. Uh, typically here, we try to engage in terms of understanding the environment of customer, trying to understand uh, you know, what will be the kind of integration that will be required, kind of volumes uh, of log that customer may have to uh, you know, uh, think about for planning uh, in, and uh, also evaluate the solution, you know, try to provide proof of concept in case of, you know, to uh, get the customer familiar with uh, the Sentinel environment. Uh, and also in case if there's any existing environment, we could probably discuss with them in terms of uh, assessing the maturity of meet the kind of uh, uh, configurations, or it could be in terms of uh, the overall process. Right? Uh, when it comes to engineering, it can, you know, we kind of engage in all aspects, be it uh, right from implementation, trying to 
enhance the existing uh, services, provide some technical gap assessments, and eventually uh, provide a managed service wherein you know, we can establish a centralized swap for our customers consuming uh, Azure Sentinel and uh, provide a 24 cross 7 security incident response and uh, uh, reporting as well as remediation support. Right? And of course, that uh, goes on uh, to say that you know, we will continue doing all of the uh, platform engineering in terms of building all of the additional use cases uh, that is required uh, for the customer environment. Next, uh, thanks. Now, how do we do this? Uh, so we kind of spend a lot of time trying to understand uh, what all is essential for an effective security monitoring. Right? You know, it's not just about uh, one solution which typically help us in uh, developing a good security monitoring capability. So, with that said, you know, we try to understand what are the different te uh, techniques and tactics adapted by a lot of the attackers in terms of, and what are the data sources which help us identify uh, those attacks in different phases, right? So with that, uh, we've kind of put out our framework in terms of what all is essential for an effective security monitoring center, right? So what we've done is we've put a blockwise uh, architecture, you know, with the first one being proactive, predictive, and then adaptive, right? Now, proactive uh, is where we can look at something more proactively, right? uh, as the name goes. Uh, say something like a deception tool where we try to you know lure uh, some of the at, um, attackers and try to find out what are the kind of TTPs that he is engaging with, right? Or it could be in terms of dark web monitoring, trying to identify what all uh, credentials or weapons which uh, the attacker can consume of a customer, right? Uh, or be it in terms of security prioritization, you know, having a good database of the existing vulnerabilities and try to see what are the uh, vulnerabilities that are out there for exploit, right? And uh, adaptive is, you know, talk about the uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence capabilities, uh, which typically solutions like UEBA or the EDRs or NDR can contribute towards. And you know, these are being more effective in identifying some of the zero-day threats in our uh, uh, in in the in in the customer environments or you know the overall security monitoring space. Right. The predictive part is the centralized uh, uh, area or, or the core of the overall security monitoring, where we kind of correlate all of the data that we gather, be it from the infrastructure component, be it from any of these uh, uh, proactive components, like, you know, it could be a direct threat intelligence feed coming back into my SIM platform, or it could be some cross references, which is done through my uh, SOAP platform. Right, and also as part of the responses, some of the standardization of, uh, uh, say, SOPs uh, could be established through the SOAP platform, wherein we could automate even the responses. Right, so that's this is what we think is effective uh, way of uh, handling or you know identifying uh, the most evasive threats in an environment. Right, and of course on the top layer is you need to have uh, experts at work who can proactively monitor around the clock. Uh, consume some of the threat advisories, try to, you know, continuously use them uh, as part of uh, the alerting or threat hunting or, you know, updating the knowledge bases, right? Uh, now, let's see how exactly can we establish all of this, uh, be it with Azure Security Services and how, how much of it is possible with Azure Sentinel. Let me, can you click next? Right. At the core of it, if you see Azure Sentinel, like David mentioned, is a solution which comes with built-in SOAR. I mean, it's a it's a SIM with a built-in SOAR capability in it. And uh, like uh, we also saw that there is a capability to add your own machine learning uh, into the uh, uh, Azure Sentinel. We can also use the UEBA functionality. There's a built-in UEBA functionality of uh, uh, Sentinel. And uh, we can look at the Azure Defender which kind of, again, is a multifold uh, solution, but more from an EDR perspective. Uh, as part of India, you know, right now, uh, you know, of course, uh, as part of the uh, O365 or e E3, E5 subscriptions, customers can leverage some of these uh, services like the Defender as well as the ADA or the ADPs. Uh, but also right now, uh, you know, Azure Sentinel is working very closely with Vectra and providers like Dark Trace, which can also contribute uh, towards this. Click next. 
Like David was mentioning about, you know, some of the threat intelligence feeds that are available. Uh, yes, you know, there are multiple ways in which we can uh, feed back into the Sentinel. It would be available in open source uh, threat intelligence feeds, be it in terms of um, MISP or have it all uh, collaborated in a CTI framework, which can then feed back into the Sentinel. Right. Right. Uh, going on to the next one. No, uh, Kalyan, can you go back to the previous one? Right. Right. So on the uh, last areas is, is the security prioritization, where we, again, could look at Defender as some of the solutions. Uh, so this is how we typically can establish a you know, next-gen uh, SOC uh, service with either Azure services or you know, bring in some additional components to contribute further. Next, uh, Kalyan. Now, this is a typical architecture. There's always a lot of question around, you know, how exactly all of this uh, would look like, you know, and is it uh, applicable only for uh, an Azure cloud, or can we extend this to a hybrid environment? Can I also onboard my other cloud services like AWS or GCP? Can I onboard uh, my SaaS applications? So here's, you know, an integrated view of how exactly, uh, you know, overall architecture would look like you know, at the core. You see all of the Azure uh, Sentinel and all the Azure service components uh, part of your subscription can be integrated directly into Sentinel. And then you can have connectors across uh, on your AWS environment or your on-premise environment where you could use that as an aggregator to, to collect logs from the um, on-premise data center. The other interesting aspect, uh, you know, which I really like about Azure Sentinel is this ability to incorporate IoT uh, security monitoring as well into it, right? Uh, with the advancement uh, of Azure Defender into the IoT space, uh, with the agent-based as well as agentless capabilities brought in uh, on the IoT space, now that data can be directly, again, integrated back into the center. Earlier, um, you know, there were some use cases built part of the security center, which was uh, also allowing um, the ability to add IoT security monitoring, but with Defender, it makes it more effective and uh, have a holistic uh, security monitoring estate. Next, uh, Glenn. Right. Now, let's try to understand how exactly, uh, you know, what all is available. We did uh, hear from David in terms of uh, what all, uh, you know, capabilities are available as part of Azure Sentinel, but uh, when we talk about visibilities, you know, as a service provider or as a customer, some you know people would want to see where exactly can I you know, do the overall monitoring? Uh, what kind of visibility would I like to have as part of this uh, solution? And how exactly can I handle all of those incidents, right? So, you know, uh, as as such, there is an availability of uh, the overview uh, estate where you know, the entire uh, uh, security incidents uh, are kind of displayed where we can uh, uh, use the visualization capabilities to build out on the incidents. Uh, workbook, there's quite a few workbooks that are already built into uh, the uh, customer environment. Um, in fact, uh, I'm sorry, not in the, uh, built into the Azure Sentinel uh, services. Uh, we could further add uh, additional customized, uh, you know, uh, workbooks. Uh, based on customer requirements, um, you know, as long as there is data available, it's a very straightforward and easy aspect to establish more uh, customer-specific uh, workbooks, you know, to suit your requirements and, and to have the right kind of visibility of the areas that you're more focused upon. Right? And as part of incident handling right now, uh, the integration with ServiceNow is something that is out of the box available. Uh, but yeah, of course, uh, we can... Uh, get some more integrations as part of the customization capabilities. Uh, we can bring in uh, some more ITS improvement. Here's a service now is not the uh, tool that is consumed, but we could always work and integrate with some custom connectors to have this uh, integrations synced up with the ITS and platform so that we could have uh, you know, some um, tracking of the incident that are being triggered or bring in some autom automation as part of the ticket handling. Next. Yeah. Now, in terms of detection, there are multiple things where, uh, you know, like uh, 
like David was mentioning, uh, there is also uh, AI and ML capabilities which is uh, used as part of the detection capabilities in uh, Sentinel. Uh, you know, there are two aspects. One is, of course, the analytic rules, and then uh, we also have the threat hunting. I'll go to the threat hunting in the next slide. But uh, overall, if you look at it, they're close around, like uh, roughly around 200 odd uh, you know, uh, use cases. Uh, now, all of them are well defined set of use cases. The objective has been uh, to reduce the false positive, reduce the over overhead uh, on uh, uh, the security analysts. So these are the different groups uh, or different categories in which we have uh, the alerts defined within uh, Azure Sentinel, like scheduled or Microsoft Security, Fusion or Anomaly. Fusion Anomaly are typically built on ML um, capabilities where we probably, you know, the anomaly is something which we can uh, probably duplicate but cannot be uh, modified, but somehow we can build uh, similar cases using the ML capabilities, which I'll talk about in the consecutive slides. And security, uh, Microsoft security are like built-in cases, you know, alerts coming in from the Defender. Uh, so here are some of the, you know, here's a view on the kind of mapping or rather the coverage uh, which these analytical uh, rules provide us, right? Uh, there's a mapping against uh, the mind right? And if you look at unassigned, those are some cases which typically could be, you know, cases where uh, we're getting some alerts in terms of uh, some of the, uh, say, uh, workspace alerts or, you know, subscription-based alerts which uh, are triggered, right? So what is important here is uh, try to identify and identify what are the different data sources that exist in the customer environment and add more e uh, alerts on the existing uh, uh, use cases. So that's where you know uh, our role comes in, you know, where we bring in uh, our own set of uh, use cases, which kind of uh, get established with, uh, or rather, could be rolled out for more data sources as against what was already available in Azure Sentinel. Next, Pilani. Now, in threat hunting, again, uh, there's a well-defined uh, lot of queries that are already built into uh, Azure Sentinel. And again, you know, it's not just a particular way of doing threat hunting. It's also mapped in terms of uh, the different phases of uh, the kill chain as such. Like if you can see, there's a, here's a snapshot of uh, the mapping in terms of the number of queries that are available and, and, and the different uh, uh, phases of the attack, which it can help in identifying. Right now, apart from this, what we can uh, bring in is you know uh, try to get some different uh, threat hunting. You know, what what do we base this on? It could be hypothesis driven, uh, wherein you know we uh, know that there is a exploit, and then here I mean like uh, uh, you know a similar kind of I mean exploit in a similar industry which. We can get the TTPs about and you know, put them as part of the threat hunting query so that we can proactively look for uh, any such occurrences before you know a, the customer could be impacted. You know, be a little more proactive in there, or identify you know, be it situational where in which case uh, identify some of the ground rules of the uh, customer environment. Try to identify if there's been any kind of uh, activity on it, or has there been any kind of uh, activities from the system. Uh, and identify if if it could be compromised, right? And at the same time, uh, the threat intelligence driven, you know, like we said, uh, there's a lot of advisories which we are subscribed to, and a lot of uh, dark web uh, monitoring happens uh, from our end. All of that input kind of again gets converted into uh, writing some custom queries for uh, the customers, or you know, be it uh, uh, you know putting in. Uh, the known IOCs or you know some hash uh, it could be in terms of hashes or it could be in terms of URLs so which typically gets converted into queries and it can be used uh, you know to identify any kind of uh, threats which probably could uh, persist in your environment. Next. Now as part of the detection now this is a very interesting uh, aspect right where, where uh, which like a uh, how David said, there is no boundary uh, to it, right? There's a lot of things that we can add as an need for it. Now, with that said, uh, there are different aspects of machine learning, AI and ML that kind of comes in. 
uh, as part of the Azure Sentinel. Uh, the first aspect of what is built into the uh, platform, which is the, um, it could be the analytic rules, it could be the UVBA uh, functionality, which is again, alerting based on, uh, you know, doing user profiling based on, I mean, profiling based on users or host or IP address. Uh, helps in identifying, you know, the blast radius, uh, also the threat indicators, uh, which eventually can be used to further do some threat hunting to identify, you know, what are the similar peers that are that possibly could be affected uh, in, in your environment, right? Now, apart from that, you can bring in your own machine learning. Now, this is a very interesting uh, functionality, which uh, probably no other solution uh, extends at this point. Uh, typically, the way you know, with which we were looking at it uh, when, you know, outside of Azure Sentinel would be to have a data lake solution and, you know, have that fed back or the metadata fed back into the security monitoring space. This is a similar way of uh, doing it, but, you know, you don't have to get an external, uh, you know, data lake uh, solution. Uh, what we can actually do is leverage the notebook functionality, you know, wherein uh, we can run our own uh, machine learning capabilities uh, right, um, and uh, it could also be in terms of uh, you know the existing data picks, the business related data analytics which are running already consume some of those, and if you want to run some specific uh, algorithms uh, using the, uh, the Jupyter uh, uh, notebook, we we could always establish those, and for that there's a lot of existing uh, content already in the. Um, Azure Live provided in the Azure Library. Some of them are built into the Azure Sentinel platform. Now, what we do with this again is is again multifold. Uh, there's one aspect wherein you know we look at it for the security analyst, where uh, we could use uh, for say doing further uh, threat hunting or uh, for the triaging, uh, establish more visualization uh, in the existing environment. It's it's more like a you know a, a incident investigation that you could automate. Right, and uh, the other aspect is where if you want to bring in some customized data sets. Earlier, we were trying to establish this uh, for you know the data analytics that was uh, carried out on all the IoT platform. So that's one example where you know that intelligence can be brought in again. Any of the security threats that needs to be addressed by the security team could be converted into um, alerts, which again goes back into the um, Sentinel workspace. Next. Now, uh, we've seen uh, what all do we have as part of uh, visibility, uh, what all do we have as part of detection, now we get to the response part of it, uh, which is the automation. Now, while it's straightforward to say that there is a capability of, uh, you know, uh, sword uh, within the Sentinel, it's, it's a not, not a so, uh, straightforward activity in terms of defining this. Right? So the way we do it is we go take a phase-wise approach wherein we try to identify uh, what are the kind of alerts one receives? You know, how do I classify these alerts? You know, it could be in terms of volumes, you know, repetitive alerts, which has a traditional or a standard SOP, or it could be cases which is very critical, which needs to be attended uh, uh, immediately, or it could be cases which takes a lot of time. You know, which become my focus area for automation, right? So this kind of helps us establish what should we focus as part of automation first, so that we could bring in more efficiency in the security monitoring space. Right? Now then second comes the defined phase where we try to establish the workflows for this, what are the different actions uh, that are required uh, for establishing this uh, workflow and try to identify what all actions are available uh, you know, as part of the um, Sentinel uh, logic apps capability and identify what will be the level or percentage of automation. It could be like 100% automation, where almost all of the actions are available as part of the uh, playbooks. Uh, but you know, it could be a case where some of the actions are not supported, wherein you know the automation could get restricted to only data enrichment and not to a response point. Right? And eventually, after that, we get into the execution phase where we actually define all of these playbooks, build some of these custom uh, logic apps. Right, and try to uh, establish end-to-end -end response automation. Right, and it may not always be end-to-end -end, uh, automation. It could at times be like a fifty percent automation. When we talk about fifty percent, it could be in terms of only establishing enrichment and providing information to the security analyst. 
right? And 100% automation could be a case where you know, we automate some of the responses by you know, sending an action either to a web gateway, to a you know, defender uh, solution to block a particular host. Next. Now, typically, how much time would it take uh, for us to get going, right? You know, or for anybody to get going. Uh, now, when we talk about Azure Sentinel, Azure, or Microsoft themselves would talk about one click enablement of the subscription, right? And that's only the enablement part of it. But then, you know, there's a lot of work in terms of identifying uh, how exactly you should go about what all, uh, should be integrated as part of the, uh, you know, security monitoring space. And then uh, selectively uh, implement that in terms of integrate the data sources that you have identified for security monitoring. And after that, you have to normalize some of the other mutual requirements. Um, you know, where we help uh, establish some custom specific, customer specific use cases apart from uh, the built-in uh, use cases, right? And then goes into the uh, regular monitoring phase, which is the ongoing uh, process. Now, as part of the ongoing process as well, you know, we kind of get engaged in building more uh, use cases. We don't stop at, uh, you know, in the initial stages, but it's a continuous process where we uh, constantly try to enhance the existing capabilities, try to build more uh, threat hunting queries, try to build more analytic rules, or rather establish some uh, machine learning capabilities or you know, use the ML capabilities and establish uh, more uh, reporting uh, from uh, reporting uh, through the Azure Sentinel. So these are the indicative timelines by when you know, it could be fully functional. So if you look at it from the time we click the initiate uh, button, you know, we're probably looking at some four to six weeks of time when we actually start seeing good amount of results. Right? Next. Now, uh, this is uh, the way we establish or provide uh, our SOC to our host services consuming uh, Azure Sentinel. Uh, initially, we spoke about our uh, 2.0 framework, uh, like you know, the first layer being the security incident monitoring and response. We do the incident monitoring, remediation support, threat hunting, response automation. Uh, threat intelligence, we consume either the built-in or we also have our own threat entity platform, which kind of uh, gathers a lot of data from the available open sources and uh, we feed that back into the uh, Sentinel uh, services. Uh, then, you know, so all of the items that are listed in um, green are something that we can establish or provide as a service to our customers consuming uh, the Microsoft Security Services. The items in gray are something that is not available right now. The Azure Security, for which we could look for some third-party solutions, typically the dark web monitoring, you know, we could look at something like Record of Future or Anomaly uh, to look uh, into the dark web. Uh, so this is pretty much uh, how we establish, and you know, these are the event sources um, which we typically try to integrate as part of the uh, security monitoring. So I think uh, that finishes uh, what I had for today. And I think we would uh, now get into a demo uh, by my colleague, uh, Vinayak. Thank you, Manan. Good morning and good afternoon, all. Um, welcome to the Azure demo session. And I'm excited to be part of this workshop. And uh, I really uh, appreciate you all in taking some time and attending this. So, Kalyan, next, uh, next slide, please. So, today, um, uh, the agenda for today's demo that we are going to talk about is uh, the following sections. So, to start with, um, uh, you know, we are going to talk about the Azure Sentinel prerequisites. What are the prerequisites that you need to uh, take care to enable your Azure Sentinel? And uh, you, we talk no, about. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I think you need to adjust your camera. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is better. Yeah, this is better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, and then we talk about the uh, data connectors. Uh, to connect your various uh, uh, data sources and um, analytics. Once you have those data connectors, uh, uh, you know, uh, connected, um, we will be, uh, you know, uh, we will be defining the use cases, uh, uh, which is nothing but on the analytical section. 
and um, uh, investigation uh, post defining your analytics um, uh, so whatever the rules that are matched onto the um, analytics uh, your soft team will be uh, investigating further so we'll be talking about how sentinel makes the uh, investigation more uh, easier and uh, hunting proactively looking for new anomalies and uh, threat intelligence where you uh, you know uh, where the feeds or threat indicators you can import and leverage them with the sentinel uaba a beautiful feature on user entity and behavior and analytics followed by uh, workbooks uh, dashboards and uh, visual representations and uh, last but not the least the playbooks which can help the uh, you do the automation and orchestration your threat response so before i move on to the uh, demo uh, let me talk about the prerequisites that needs to be taken care so you need to have an active uh, azure subscription and uh, you need to have this log analytics workspace as well and uh, to enable your Azure Sentinel, you need to have few uh, contributor permissions and as well as, um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, contributor permissions to the Azure Sentinel workspace and as well as um, your uh, resource group. And of course, a few data sources that may uh, require um, additional, um, you know, permissions. And last but not the least, um, uh, Sentinel is uh, pay as you go. So please do not forget to check for the pricing before you offer for uh, Azure Sentinel. So with this, I will be uh, sharing my screen so that I'll take you to the tour ride of um, Azure Sentinel. I hope uh, my screen is visible. Yes, then I, it is. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Pilya. So, that's what, so um, as I already uh, uh, I told you, like uh, we are going to talk about this log analytics workspace. So this is where uh, you come here and uh, you go ahead and create the log analytics workspace where, uh, you know, your Azure Sentinel is going to be there and uh, you, you can click on this create new workspace and you'll have to map your subscription and your resource group and provide your name and region. And then when you want you click on review and create, so uh, your uh, workspace will uh, be shown here. So for this demo purpose, we are going ahead with this existing log analytics workspace. Now, when you enable um, Azure Sentinel, the very first thing that you need to do is connect to your data sources. So for that, it's like navigate to your data connectors. Now, Azure Sentinel comes with a number of uh, built-in connectors for Microsoft solutions, which David has already informed uh, uh, in terms of Microsoft 365 Defender or um, Office 365 or Azure AD, multiple uh, Microsoft solutions. And of course, um, uh, Microsoft are building more, um, uh, you know, uh, non-Microsoft solutions as well. Uh, where you can see like today we have close to 116 different uh, connectors. But um, not to worry on the data connectors, if suppose if you are not able to see on uh, any of the products that are, that are being listed in this particular data connector section, you can always uh, use uh, common event format or uh, uh, syslog or uh, REST API. Right, to connect your data sources with your Azure Sentinel, which can be set up within a shorter time. Now, when you wanted to create or uh, connect your uh, uh, data sources, so you'll have to just navigate to this particular um, uh, section. And um, on, the, um, or on the right side, you can see that you, you can uh, get to see the open connector page. And when you open this page, like you will be given the instructions of how to uh, connect to this data connectors. And once you follow those connectors uh, instructions, um, you, you will be seeing that the uh, connect, uh, connector is uh, connected status. And also you can also see the last log receipt. So that is about the, um, uh, you know, uh, data connectors. It's very easy to set up. And of course, like once you define your um, um, data connectors, it's time for us to move on to the uh, use case uh, defining where there is nothing but your analytical section. So as Alan mentioned, 
right? So uh, analytics are based on Mitre attack framework. So for every uh, data connectors uh, you connect, it has its own analytical rules related to the data connectors. So for each, um, you know, analytical rules that you can uh, set up, like you, you, you will have the option of, um, uh, you know, setting up the uh, rule frequency, rule period, and rule threshold as per your requirements. So once your um, analytical rule is enabled, and if the uh, logs are matched or the, the alerts are matched according to this particular uh, analytical rule, the incidents will get created. And that is where, you know, when you navigate to the incidents, you will be able to see all the incidents that are being matched with this particular, uh, you know, analytical rules that you create. Let me show you one example, like um, I'm taking this um, as part of the, uh, you know, uh, this particular alert is actually um, given by Zscaler. So, um, like when, when you wanted to go ahead and, uh, you know, you, you want to investigate more onto this particular uh, incident, you can always go ahead and click this investigate where it gives you a beautiful uh, visualization. And of course, you can click on each and every entity and, uh, you know, it gives you, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, URL uh, information where your original detonated uh, URL will be shown. And uh, the detonation verdict is actually a high-level Boolean uh, determination from detonation. So here you can see that bad means uh, the site was classified as posting malware or uh, phishing content. The destination final URL is nothing but it's your final observed landing page uh, after all the redirects um, uh, from your uh, original URL. And of course, you can also see the screenshots um, of that particular page. So this is how it looks. So that's the power of um, um, Azure Sentinel, um, uh, you know, uh, the incidents and analytics section. Now I move on to um, hunting, um, where, you know, that you all wanted to have, I uh, mean, uh, to be uh, proactive about looking for security threats, but your various systems and um, uh, security appliances generate huge amount of data, right? And it will be very difficult to pass and filter into the meaningful events. So Azure Sentinel has a powerful uh, hunting search and query tools uh, to hunt for your security threat across your organization's data sources. So when you open this hunting section, uh, you, you can see a lot of uh, hunting queries, which has been uh, defined. And um, let me just give you one example um, where uh, I wanted to see, um, you know, a new process observed in the last 24 hours. So you can see here, like the query is already there and I will have to just run this query and wait for the results. And as you can see that I can see that there are three results. And if I wanted to see those results, I will have to click on to this view result and it will take me to the log section along with the query executed and uh, the output also displayed. So that, that is where, uh, you know, uh, it's very easy for us to uh, search. So this is, this is, these are the output that you can see at uh, the three uh, results, right? Now, moving on to, um, you know, uh, threat intelligence. So of course, uh, threat intelligence is currently in preview mode and very soon it's going to be in general availability. And they basically uh, represent your data describing the known existing or potential threats to the uh, system and users. Nowadays, SOC teams are facing a lot of challenges in order to improve their efficiency in their threat detection, investigation, and response. So this threat intelligence part in Azure Sentinel will address those challenges. As you can see, um, like, you know, uh, uh, you have uh, three ways uh, to uh, import or through, uh, you know, the threat uh, intelligence feeds. One is that uh, you, you have two connectors uh, readily available. That is on the um, uh, data connectors, where you can see that there is a threat intelligence platform data connectors and as well as taxi data connectors. As you can see here, the uh, the threat intelligence that uh, the source has uh, security graph, uh, which means that it is actually being imported using the threat intelligence platform data connectors. 
And in, in case if you see the source as Azure Sentinel, then you can uh, you know you can create your threat intelligence by clicking on to this add new. Since this is a demo mode, you know, we, we don't have the permission to showcase this. And of course, uh, if you see any friendly name on the taxi server, it is uh, nothing but it is imported using the threat intelligence of taxi data connectors. So by this way, like you know, you can uh, import uh, the threat intelligence piece. Moving on, I'll be um, talking about this um, entity behavior, uh, which is uh, uh, user entity and behavior analytics. So Sentinel collects logs and alerts from all of its data uh, sources which are connected and it analyzes them and builds a baseline behavior profile of your organization entities such as users, post, IP addresses, and applications. So inspired by the Gartner's paradigm for uh, UEBA solution, so Azure Sentinel provides actually an outside-in approach based on the three frames of reference, which are nothing but use cases, data sources, and analytics. Now, let me just show you one uh, example here. Can I, just, uh, just sorry to interrupt, uh, just to check on time. Uh, in the next three minutes, if you can wrap up your demo. We have sure. five minutes for Q&A and then we can close sure. the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, on this particular section, like, you know, I, I'm able to see the OS type as Windows and um, the version as 10 and the, uh, you know, a lot of details that you can see on this. And of course, um, you can also see a lot of insights and uh, uh, the related alerts and activity time. And uh, when you enable the Azure Defender and Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, you can always get to have all these alerts and as well as the recommendation given by the, uh, you know, uh, the respective sources. Now, you, as you can see, like, you know, in the inside sections, like you, you get all these type of information. And if you want to deep dive onto this, you can click onto this and it will take you to the, uh, you know, uh, the log section and it will give you all the respective outputs. Moving on, I'll be talking about workbooks, um, which is nothing but, uh, you know, the uh, uh, it, basically in today's world, uh, we require dashboards, visualization, representation of data, trends, and anomalies, uh, which are very much essential. So um, Sentinel has a lot of um, out-of-the-box um, uh, workbooks, and uh, just wanted to showcase one uh, uh, workbook part here. So you can click on to this and um, you can really see a lot of uh, information uh, in terms of, um, you know, a different data sources that, that you are connected. So this is how uh, your workbook looks like. And last but not the least, um, you know, the playbook part uh, where um, uh, David and uh, Anand, both of them mentioned about the playbooks part. So where you can do an orchestration and automation um, for your threat response. I'm just showing one example that, you know, this is how you actually configure the, um, you know, uh, the playbooks where it has a, a kind of a workflow where you can define those workflows and, uh, you know, and you, you have to call this particular uh, playbook under the analytical section so that all the automation and orchestration happens. That's all about I have in uh, uh, you know demo part. So I hand over uh, the mic uh, to uh, Kalyani, and as well as the screen share. Thank you, Vinayak. That was uh, that was a quick demo in this group. Small. Yes, I'm just checking. Uh, any questions? Uh, Guess, please drop it in the QA section. Uh, we'll pick it from there. We have one question there. Yeah, can we have custom content in the dashboard or the workbook? Um, Vijay, you want to uh, take that? Uh, yes, yeah, we can we can build any number of uh, custom queries uh, uh, through the supported language called KQL, and those queries can then be used. Uh, to really build uh, different types of dashboards and workbooks as needed. Uh, as, as Vinayak was showing, right, there's, there's a lot of inbuilt workbooks already available, and those, some of those queries can be 
can be customized uh, to create different views. Uh, so any sort of customizations in terms of creation of dashboards and workbooks is possible. Thank you, Vijay. Um, how, to, how can we integrate custom application or non-supported devices to Azure Sentinel? Uh, David? David, do you want to take it? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? How can we integrate custom applications or non-supported devices to Azure Sentinel? Oh, okay. Um, so there are different ways that you can bring in um, solutions that aren't uh, that there isn't a custom connector for. So you you can build your own connectors either using Azure Logic Apps or um, PowerShell or some some, some other scripting uh, 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 method uh, to pull data out of the logging mechanism, whatever solution it might be and uh, pull them into to Sentinel. So, so there's different ways that that can be accomplished, but uh, obviously the easiest way is to either use the REST APIs or to uh, use the data connectors that are built in. But, uh, but if they have a solution that doesn't support any of those, then, then it is possible to build them. And, and I presume that um, Happiest Minds has that um, skill set. Yeah, that, that's right, David. And uh, in fact, for some of our customers, we have built uh, custom connectors uh, for solutions, for example, like identity management, which is Okta or Cisco umbrellas. So, so it's definitely possible and then not a very complicated process. Okay. Just one more question. Um, does Happiest Minds provide POC on Sentinel? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have been helping customers to, to really uh, understand how the solution fit in their environment, uh, conduct POCs, uh, see them, uh, the solution working in, in real time in their environment. Uh, we do offer POCs to the customer. I think that's it. Uh, those were the questions uh, that I received over the chat and in the Q&A bar. Um, it, if there are any other questions, uh, you guys can reach out uh, to your Happiest Minds contact and you know, we can, this team can get back to you uh, with questions. Thank you so much for attending this session. Thank you, speakers. Uh, this was a very insightful session and uh, uh, thank you, everyone. All right. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the time today. Thanks, Kalan, for organizing this. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you.